everyone. This is Grit from Gearist. I am Brandon, and that guy right there is Aaron. What's up, Aaron? Hey, man. How's it going? I cannot get out the time. This is seriously, for those listening and watching, I did that intro like five times before <laughs> before I got it right. I was like, hey, this is Brandon, that's Grit, and this is Aaron. And it just did not work out. Anyway, how is everybody? Thank you so much for joining, listening, watching. Aaron, you having a good week so far? It's been a week so far. It so, has been a week so far. Yeah. So for those watching, it's Tuesday and it feels like Thursday afternoon it, already. It does. And so it's Tuesday, kind of like midday, which is why neither of us are having a frosty adult beverage. At least I'm not. I don't think no. Aaron is. <laughs> no, I'm not. Trust me. We both have work to do. Yeah. Um, so thank you guys uh, so much for watching. If you haven't uh, subscribed, please like, share, subscribe, uh, whatever you're listening to this on. If you're listening via Stitcher or Spotify or whatever, Overcast, any of those things, please like, sh subscribe, and share. And on YouTube, we would love to uh, hear you guys' comments. So the last episode, we talked all about P quite frankly, and how that hydration is measured, how, how we do handle having to, you know, heed nature's call on the race course and things like that. So, uh, yeah, let's, before we jump into kind of today, what we're gonna talk about today, by the way, is a top five things that, uh, you should look out for when selecting a trail shoe. Now we're looking at this specifically relative in this case, because Aaron is getting ready for the Leadville trail 100 coming up August 20th. Because of that, we are framing it mostly around that, but we're going to talk about some of those other considerations in there. So, we really want to hear your feedback on this very gear centric show today. But before we get into that, Aaron, how's your training going? Good. It's going well. Um, California the last week or yep. the week before, um, slow week, ramping back up. I will say yesterday was one of those days where I set off. I got a mile from the, my house and was like, you know what? I'm good. Turned around <laughs> and walked home and, uh, for me, I don't know if it was mental. It wasn't really physical. My legs felt good. My feet felt good. Yeah. Um, I just didn't have it in me that day. And then yeah. I set off today with, okay, just go put five miles in um, because it was the morning and I had work to do. But by mile four and a half, I was like, I could go another 10 easily. I felt good. So for me, it was, it started off slow, but it's, coming back so i feel good how about you you look like you're getting out there a good amount now yeah um and uh so one uh my run yesterday i i was gonna do it on sunday did a run on sunday but um not as long as i wanted to so yesterday was the bulk and then uh, i did not start my watch until loop two when i looked down and i was like oh how fast did i do that oh i didn't do that loop in any <laughs> amount of time uh but it was really good Strava, it didn't happen right right so <laughs> so in that case i didn't do anything for like the last three years um but no it was really good uh i i, I was telling aaron everyone before the show um I'm getting to that spot where I'm going out and doing these, these longer runs longer for me. I get, again, some of you guys are cranking out, you know, 80 mile, hundred mile weeks. I'm not doing that yet. Um, but where it just felt good, I wasn't pushing the pace. That's part of it, you know, going, staying within yourself. Um, but it just felt good and nice and cruisy. And that's kind of what I want to get back to because once personally, once I had that nice aerobic zone two base, um, then it just becomes about time on feet, right? Once that base is there, I could run forever, you know, and it's your, your body that kind of shows you those limits. But from a cardio and fitness standpoint, that's where to me at this point, that's the most important thing to get back. You know what I'm saying? hundred percent. I mean, I took six months essentially off from my last hundred and it was those first for me, it was the entire month of January where I'd spent just run, just yep. go for a run, no tempo, no workout, no nothing, whether it was one mile, two miles or three miles, it was run. Um, and yeah, by February, it was, you know, it was a joy to put the shoes on and go out for five yeah. miles and not have to worry about how hard is today going to be. I knew it was going to be an easy day. So yeah, I'm glad to hear it's starting to turn around. It is, and and uh, we talked about you know we, Aaron and I were texting back and forth. We talked about you coming out 
Um, and so hopefully by the time you get here, like we talked about Hall Ranch on the show mm -hmm. with Neil, uh, we'll try to do a little bit of that, probably go up to Leadville at least once the snow should be mostly good, but the snow should be largely good pretty soon here. Um, and kind of try to get some of those big days in. And I'd love for you to be able to come out and not feel like you're dragging me around. You know what I'm saying? So that would be really good. <laughs> to be fair, you're still sitting at. 7,000 feet, 6,000 feet. Okay. I'm sitting at five. <laughs> yeah, there is that. So. Um, it'll be good, man. I'm, I'm pumped. Uh, I'm like getting excited about it and starting to see, and you know, when we're looking at today's show, it's um, again, as I mentioned, we're going to be talking about kind of five things to look at when you're, when you're selecting running shoes, I, I start getting into that mindset of s event specific stuff, right? Because like you're saying, everything up to February and then, or excuse me, February until whenever, you're kind of getting into that fitness thing. You're not really necessarily looking at an event and going, okay, I want to do this. And for me, having that carrot, because that's, I mean, that's what all of these things are about, right? It's, it's incentive. That's what a carrot is when you talk about carrots and sticks and all that stuff. That carrot... uh as it becomes more in focus, it becomes more motivating, you know, as opposed to some amorphous, I'm going to go out and grind. You know right. what I'm saying? Oh, hundred percent. So that, as, as I'm looking at it now, it's, you know, I'm at the point now where I'm starting to look at pieces of apparel, shoes, things yep. like that. And it's not, what do I need or what do I want? But it's what, is going to serve me between now yes. and August 20th. And what will, what do I need to start to get used to wearing or, or used to wearing? So when August 20th comes, I am as prepared and as ready for that race morning as I can possibly be. Yeah. I, so, you know, there's, um, there's somebody I, I know, um, and they were talking about, trying to kind of, uh, and, and it's funny because we're, this show is called grit, right? I mean, because it's the grit of every day getting to the, not just to the finish line, but to the start line. And this person is not involved in endurance sports at all. Um, they're, they're very much a, a team and ball sports person. It's not to knock on team and ball sports people necessarily, but this person was saying I could get on a, a treadmill and you might be able to run faster than me, but I guarantee you I'll run longer than you. And I said, no, because what's going to happen is you're going to break yourself and then you're going to push through that. And your goal isn't going to be a goal at all. And it's not going to be wise. It's just going to be pure force of will. And at the end of the day, you're going to hurt yourself. And I mean, even and in, in this person, it's funny because they kind of idolize David Goggins and I love David Goggins too, right? I don't think that anybody would, would disagree that David Goggins is a pretty badass dude but if you listen to Goggin's story about his first ever ultra um which was like one of his first ever races period he did a hundo and almost like killed himself right because he was drinking like protein shakes and eating saltines and so this person was basing their sense this person that i was talking to their sense of toughness on that david goggins and i go bro david goggins today is a high level, high performing endurance athlete who knows exactly what he's doing because he's approaching it with wisdom and not the hubris of utter force of will. Yeah. And, and that's kind of, I think, I think, I don't want to put thoughts in your mind, words in your mouth, but I think that's what you're talking about. Like when you're looking at a pair of shorts, great a pair of shorts is a pair of shorts is a pair of shorts to most people. <laughs> yeah you, you know but when you're looking at it, it's like well how long are they why does that matter what is the liner like is there a liner at all are you going to do like separate boxer briefs are you gonna do this are you gonna do this like how does that serve you so that you don't have to worry about the force of will aspect you know yeah at 100 percent. i mean i look at my first ultra or yeah. my first run in general right my my first half marathon that i thought i could do you know, at almost 300 pounds because it was a good idea. Yeah. Um, I had, yeah, knee length shorts, Ball regular length. cotton boxers, Woo. regular cotton socks, uh, like a, a dry all natural fit. baby. All yeah, natural. Yeah. <laughs> uh, a shirt, you know, it was a, a tech shirt, like a running shirt, but it was 
slightly too big, like nothing that I would wear today. Yep. And I chafed oh every way, every possible place you could. <sighs> um, and when you get, I mean, if you don't know, that's going to affect you physically. It's going to affect you mentally. And if you have the knowledge and the capability to mitigate those things, why wouldn't you? Yeah, it's, I mean, it's setting hubris aside, right? It's setting your own ego aside to go, you know, maybe I should work smarter, not harder. This person, frankly, is an out and out idiot. Um, I mean, honestly, they're so arrogant that they can't see the forest for the trees with those things. Um, sure, yeah. And I, don't, I don't feel bad saying that. Um, and, you know, that's that's again, it's kind of like if you do these things, you know, we talk about find joy living, right? So find joy in those smaller things, the minutia, but in order to do that, you need to remove those barriers, right? So, so that how we use have to hashtag FJL. Um, so with that, when you can remove the variable of shorts that aren't going to fit or shoes that aren't going to do right, or socks that aren't going to handle your feet the way that you want, those are the things that help you to actually embrace what you're there to do. And that's to cross that finish line. Right. Absolutely. So, yeah. Um, all right. Well, let's talk about shoes. All right, guys. So we've got five things that we're talking about shoes here. And, um, and, and this is kind of like, obviously there are going to be a lot of different opinions on this. So we really, really, really want to hear some comments. You can tweet at us, tweet at me at the gearist, uh, go on Instagram at gearist, uh, Aaron at a R R O N G A R R O D. So it's, Aron Garad. um, and if you're watching this on YouTube, those are our, yeah, here we're pointing at our, our screen names for Instagram. Um, so, but we want to hear your comments, honestly, because there's going to be such a, a, a dearth, is that the right word? A breadth of opinions Yes. on, um, not a dearth, that's something else, a breadth of opinions on these things. So these are just kind of like what Aaron and I are going to talk about. What is, what we kind of look at, uh, when choosing a running shoe and again, a trail shoe rather. And again, this is very specific around what we're looking at now, which is the Leadville trail 100, August 20th, 2022. So number one. Uh, we'll just kind of start with the bottom of the shoe because that's where you start is the lug depth. So, uh, when you're looking at a trail running shoe and Aaron, you've got a shoe sitting right beside you. I'm sure I have a, I have a hiking boot sitting right beside me, which I guess I could point to, uh, when you're looking at a, a shoe or a boot for that matter, you really want to consider the type of ground you're running on hiking on whatever that is. Um, for instance, if you're on the East Coast, where Aaron is, uh, where there are a lot more forests with kind of peaty ground, that's much more dirt. You know, there's, there, yes, there's certainly dry places in Aaron where you are, there's a lot of sand as well. Um, you're going to need or want, in many cases, more lug, right? So a, a deeper lug over probably four millimeters, depending on the, you know, the, the type of material and whether it's durable enough. If you're going to be running on roads, uh, or even dirt roads, you probably don't need much of a lug here in Colorado. Very, very dry. It's not to say there aren't places that don't, we don't have peaty forests and kind of things like that. But generally here, you don't really need too much lug. Over four millimeters is not really necessary. And frequently half that is necessary. Um, and the reason is in a softer ground, you want that lug to sink in and kind of really grab it. Here, where there's a lot of rock, dry ground, things like that, you need a little bit of grab, but it's much more about the material, uh, so the type of rubber, right? So in the case of something like Solomon, they use Arconta Grip, and uh, v or, uh, Hoka, they use Vibram. Uh, even even then, you can go with different types of Vibram rubber. Yep, Aaron's holding up that shirt right there. It's got the Vibram rubber on it. Vibram, even in itself, has different grades of rubber, right? So the, sh the type of Vibram rubber that's on a climbing shoe an aggressive climbing shoe isn't going to be the same that's on a work boot, isn't going to be the same that's on a trail shoe. So all of these things matter very differently um, relative to the lug depth. What are, you, what, are your, what are your thoughts on that, Aaron, as you prepare, again, on a softer ground, but are coming here to a, a more dry kind of experience? Yeah, so I look at a couple things. I think to, to the, the – when I'm talking – outsole it's one do i need a lug mm -hmm. um do i need a, a deep lug but also the the environment in which i'm going so for for leadville for instance i know it's going to be dry but i also know it has the ability to to rain or snow or sleet on the day 
Yep. Um, so you could be dealing with slick rock. So while I may not need a six millimeter lug, I'm going to want probably some kind of lug, but something that if it gets slippery, if it gets wet, something that's going to, I'm not going to slip and slide all over the rocks because right. there's going to be more rocks there than there are here. <clears throat> um, but yeah, I mean, I know the terrains out there is different than here. Um, here I, I have, you know, some speed goats that have, um, a decent lug on them, but I know I can run 10 miles on the road if I have to with them. Yeah. Um, so transferring that over, you know, to Leadville, do I, will I wear a speed goat? I'm not sure yet. Um, I'll certainly not wear a, like a racing flat. Um, yep. but we'll see. Um, it's going to definitely de depend on the weather conditions, probably 48 hours before and through, through my expected finish time. And, you know, I mean, something that, especially when I'm in high country, whether it's uh, late summer, early fall or early spring, uh, even now, I mean, it's April 26 as we record this. Even now, I carry with me when I go up to where there might be snow, like a crampon, right? So like micro spikes, yak tracks to a certain degree, but uh, you need to have more, um, even more of a lug than your traditional yak tracks that people that live in more city setting might be used to. Um, some more spiky as opposed to just the coils because those aren't really going to do much in snow. Um, <clears throat> so yeah, it's absolutely consideration of what weather is coming up. So good call. Yeah. Um, all right. So now the next thing is the upper, right? So the upper more broadly, and, and we were talking about it and, uh, before the show, and it's really the, a lot of that is the breathability aspect. A lot of that's going to be things that you don't consider until it's too late. And one of the things that I mentioned on a previous show, uh, I forget what exactly we we're talking about, but it has to do with drainage, right? So whether that is drainage of sweat or water that you're dumping on your head or water crossing or anything like that, you, when you're looking at the upper, I, I and I, I'll, I'll say this, when it comes to a running shoe, I don't mind a waterproof shoe, especially if it's a road shoe, that I'm not really, there's not going to be anything coming over the collar of the shoe. Um, I don't mind that being waterproof, but when I get a trail shoe, it's pretty seldom that I'm going to go for something super waterproof. And the big reason there is that that stuff that comes in, even though it's supposed to be able to drain out <laughs> through a, a membrane, it doesn't drain out nearly like it's supposed to. Um, so with that, so that's the water aspect. Uh, I look at, uh, because I don't think the drain holes in the bottom of a shoe work, but I look at how much water can drain out around kind of where the upper meets the midsole. Do you know what I mean? Right. Yeah, absolutely. So like, for those who can see Brandon stock and like here, how yeah. does it drain through here? Yep. Um, which is important. I think, especially when you're talking Leadville that, you know, has water crossings, right? right? They may not be deep, but as soon as your ankle goes underwater, Doesn't anything matter. that goes in here <laughs> has to come out yep. because if it doesn't, you're prone to blisters, foot rot, all kinds of things, especially if, if your foot, your shoe doesn't drain. So yep. yeah, super important. I, I, I rather take my shoe off and knock a rock out than take my shoe off and dump water out. Yeah, exactly. And, and again, it's not to knock on, there's some really cool membrane materials out there, like your, your Gore-Tex shoes, all those things. Um, and they do drain better than something more solid, but still it's not nearly the same as, as something else, um, that actually is, is drainable. And the other thing that Aaron mentioned, and this does happen here, I know it happens there, uh, with sand and things like that, but how much is dirt? So if a shoe has a super open weave, uh, you're going to get dirt and like dust. And especially over the course of a hundred miles, water crossings are no, cause water crossing is just going to turn dirt into mud. But what happens is you get that fine particulate inside the shoe. And for me, it always seems to kind of congregate, uh, like under my, between the little like ball of my toes and the, the metatarsal heads there, it like tends to gather there. And then it winds up, you wind up running weird, right? So dirt getting in is another huge consideration to that. And especially there, sand, right? Yeah. So we get sand and, and dust this time of year. Yep. It's a lot of uh, yeah dust and pollen floating around. So as yeah. you're kicking it and it ends up in your shoe. But yeah, so it's like a tighter weave 
Um, and I'm holding this up because it's my only one. It has some overlays, so you're not going to get all the uh, dust or dirt or those little rocks um, that you would with, say, like a shoe like this, where you can see the the open mesh. Yep. While these are great to run in uh, when you're talking like a road run, putting taking those out on the trail, you start to get a lot more of that dirt and debris in your in your sock and between the sock and the, and the bottom of the foot which then can cause, you know, some, some rubbish and some friction that if you can mitigate, mitigate. Yeah. Mitigate. That works. I, I mean, anytime, anytime there is friction in your shoe, especially that you're not used to it, you need to clear that up. You know? Yeah. I mean, so having sand, dust, dirt, whatever in there, not a good situation. So, um, all right. The next thing is this kind of broad, but I mean, it's, it's worth talking about because there's so many aspects to it and that's fit. Um, <clears throat> a lot of people, when they're talking about fit, they're going to talk about the size, right? Because not all I wear size 11, not all size 11s are made the same, right? So in some places you're going to need to go up or down a half size Solomon, for instance, historically speaking, I, I think it's in Adidas actually, sometimes they fit a little small. So you might want to go up a half size. So, you know, that's part of your fit. Absolutely. But that's really a sizing thing. When I talk about fit, what I'm really talking about is how does the shoe fit or the foot rather fit within the shoe, right? So we're talking about height, right? From, so from the bottom of your foot to the top, uh, do you have to open the laces super, super wide? Is there enough room to open the laces even wider if your foot starts to swell or something like that? Right? So the other thing is that how locked down is the heel? You know, there are a lot of, there are plenty of shoes. Uh, there's one that I'm thinking of in particular that I won't mention, <laughs> that I won't mention by name because I think they've remedied this. Uh, but this was a shoe that had a great open forefoot, but the heel got really swimmy, right? So there was also a ton of room in the heel and I have a very average foot. Um, but then there's shoes like Topo Athletic. Topo Athletic has a really wide open forefoot, very foot shaped, uh, four foot toe box area, but then the heel does a nice job of really cradling the foot and holding it really, really well. Um, so these are all aspects that I think, uh, when I think of fit because your feet swell over a hundred miles, your feet, hell your feet can swell over, <laughs> over five miles, 10 miles. If yeah. your nutrition isn't right. So, you know, how about you, Aaron? What are your, what are your, yeah, kind of I mean, I on? think of the same things, right? So for me, it's toe box. How does yep. the toe box feel? Um, do I have enough room for my, as you know, as my, as I run for my toes to spread out, yep. um, what's that heel feel like? I also look at kind of the thickness around the, the I guess the collar yep. um, and the tongue, because after a while, if it gets wet, you stretch it out. Do you have room to, to lock it back down halfway yep. through? Um, is that tongue going to bother you? Are those laces going to bother you later? Um, I look at all those variables when I'm talking about fit. I think to your point, once you try a shoe on, you know, if it fits from size, right? Yeah. Yeah. You know, the size you, you should be wearing. If you don't go to your local running store, get properly fit for yep. your size. Um, when you're talking about fit, when it comes to race day is what do you need? You, you're going to wear a racing flat for a 5K, right? You're going to yes. wear something super t snug, super tight that has zero, you know, expansion because you 20 minutes and it, you're, you're off. When you're talking about a shoe you're going to wear for 20, 30 hours, you need something that's going to stay comfortable, stay feeling good. If you have to adjust the laces here or there, that's one thing. But if you're adjusting the way it fits, you probably need a different shoe. Yeah. And, and that's the other thing is that don't be afraid, you know, to modify your shoe. I mean, honestly, if there have been shoes where I have where the tongue comes way too high up, like it's just seemingly extra material. And it's like, cut that down. I mean, I'm wearing a shoe right now uh, that I'm going to be doing a review on here in the next few days. Um, that's from Merrill. Uh, great trail shoe. I'm actually really liking it. Good feel, nice pop, nice material, nice and cush. But what I was finding myself with this stock sock liner in it is just behind the first metatarsal head. So the ball of your foot, right? So just Ooh. back of that, which is not an uncommon spot for a hot spot, you know? So 
what I did, and it just so happens that I'm about to review these as well, is I put in this uh, sock liner or, or footbed or whatever you want to call it from uh, Superfeet. And it's a super feet run. Um, it's got a rigid back two thirds of the foot. So when it comes to orthotics for me, I don't really consider this an orthotic per se, because an orthotic is trying to correct something. Um, the back two thirds of this is the sock liner is pretty rigid because that part of your foot isn't super dynamic or is at least isn't di as dynamic and doesn't move as much as the front part of your foot. But the front third front half to third right in that area is it allows the foot to do it at once and it eliminated that hot spot over the course of my eight mile run uh yesterday and i mean i was getting hot that hot spot after like four miles previously Ooh. so yeah. you know it's kind of like finding and it wasn't terrible like it wasn't a blister but it was it was annoying enough that i went if i were wearing this for the next 90 miles <laughs> and i'm not right if i were wearing this for the next 10 miles it might result in a blister and it's exactly what we're talking about with the upper right uh so in, in dirt getting in there so if there's an alteration you need to make to your shoe make it i mean you bought it it's yours if you're worried about how pretty it looks maybe that's a different consideration <laughs> but yeah. you know so anyway um okay now we're gonna talk about protection so when i talk about protection uh, and people might look at this different ways we're talking generally about protection from rocks and that doesn't just come on things that you're going to kick it comes with the things that you're stepping on i knew i had a, I had a buddy years ago he was running some race i forget what it was maybe it was rocky raccoon or something but whatever the race was it was super rocky um, and they were sharp rocks. And he, he, when he finished the race, and he did really well, he's a fast guy, but his feet were just bruised to hell um, because the shoes that he wanted to run in something super light um, and something that was good for his foot. And so he did, but there was no rock plate and there was not enough material. So like, uh, you know, Aaron has held up the Hoka on a, on a speed or the Hoka speed goat here a few times. So like, that's got a lot of material with like 30 some millimeters of stack underfoot. In other words, the foam, um, underfoot is, is pretty fat and that's going to account for not having to have a rock plate in a lot of cases. This guy hadn't either got his feet all bruised up. So there are two things that we're primarily talking about with protection. One, the toe cap. So that's if you kick things and if you run at all even if it's on flat paved surfaces you will find something that will be these like a penny you will kick it on the ground and just eat it one of these days so there's that and then there's the uh, rock plate aspect uh, or material so uh, for me frankly from the the toe cap i love having a good toe cap um i don't like when it adds a bunch of weight to a shoe uh, it doesn't need to, you know, if it's cleverly designed and it's structurally sound, the hardness of the material is kind of negligible. Um, and I, I, I wonder, and I really don't know the answer to this, but I wonder how many shoe companies just throw a really hard toe cap in there that just probably weighs twice as much as it needs to, because they're like accounting for somebody dropping an anvil on their foot or something versus somebody who makes something that's more stitched and more structurally sound that's half the weight it's got some plates in it that just kind of do the same job as fast as you're probably going to kick anything so there's that uh well so aaron i mean what are you talking about think about a toe cap and then we'll then we'll get into the rock plate aspect um for me i like the welded overlay toe yep. cap right so something like again we'll yep. show you this but you can you can see it's just a welded overlay. It's some material that's got some protection, but not too much. Um, lightweight, yep. um, little more breathable. The toe cap necessarily isn't breathable, but um, it's not gonna it's not gonna add that rigidity. So right. when you're when you're flexing the foot, um, it's not presenting like a hot spot where the where the toe cap ends. Yeah. Um, so those for me are when I, when I talk about toe cap, I definitely want something because after 15, 20 hours and you're still in a race, like you're not picking your feet up nearly as high as you were. hundred percent. Um, so you're going to kick something. I always do. Um, 
You know, I'm, I'm fairly certain I broke a toe in my first hundred because I didn't pick my feet up, uh, you know, fast enough. And, but yeah, so the, an overlay, um, welded is, is my typical go-to. I do not like those thick rubber overlays that go across the foot because I find I get more of the hot spot form where your foot bends at the, up there. Yeah. I mean, it's just much more chance for it to dig into the top side of your foot. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and then there's the rock plate aspect. So, you know, there are different types of rock plates. Um, some shoes, which have more of that kind of, um, what's the word, not p or whatever, basically the carbon plates that are now being put into the bottom of a bunch of racing shoes. Right. So those are fantastic because they act as kind of a de facto rock plate, but they don't also don't necessarily need to be in a trail shoe. Um, so those are kind of a rock plate. Sometimes you'll have an EVA rock plate. Uh, there's actually material that is used in a lot of helmets, uh, ski helmets in particular that acts kind of like a non Newtonian fluid. And if you guys know what that is, uh, basically if you put enough corn, this right ratio of corn starch in water, you can walk on it. Like you can dance on it and jump on it and r run on it, whatever you won't sink. But as soon as you stop moving, you sink down in. So with a hard impact, it becomes a harder material. Um, and so that's kind of, I think there's some materials that are being used as rock plates like that kind of a specialized type of foam where when it encounters a hard rock, it actually hardens up because of that sudden impact. But then the rest of the time, it's much more, I don't want to say cushy necessarily, but it's a much, there's, it's not as, it's not super rigid and hard. Um, and then again, the shoe that Aaron held up a second ago, it, you have just enough material under there that kind of the arm mat or the foam or whatever is taking care of any rock protection under there. I mean, do you prefer one of those over the other, Aaron? Um, so I prefer the thicker sole yep. with a good bottom because for the most part, that's going to stop any, for me, it's going to, it's enough. Um, at least it was like at Bryce Canyon. Um, that's another rocky place down in, in Southern Utah. So it's, it's worked for me. Um, I've run in carbon plated shoes and shoes with rock plates. I find they're a little more firm shoe like a firm underfoot mm -hmm. um i'd be interested to to know how the new uh the new shoe from hoka that's come out or coming out mm -hmm. um with the dual rock plates yep. on either side that may and i've seen the ones that have rock plates kind of forward back um like yeah. dual rock plates mm -hmm. um but again they seem like it's added weight added uh, rigidity that I don't necessarily need. So for me, the stack height, anything 30 plus is good for me. Um, we talk about it. Yeah. Um, I think it was Topo a few years ago. They were, their shoe had a kind of plated rock plate. So it was like, it was kind of like separated the metatarsals and basically it was really to protect you from like a stabby piece right so it was that kind of sections of rock plate right so it cut yep. down on that weight um good stuff all right let's talk you kind of started to mention this a second ago uh cushion um i admittedly have been typically speaking i like good ground feel and what I mean by that, uh, for those of you who don't really know what I, mind I mean by that, is I, I want to know what's underfoot to a large degree. I feel like it gives me better feedback. I get I get better try Like, I just run better, right? I feel more connected to the ground. I feel more agile. I feel like I can adapt to the any off-kilter terrain, off-camber terrain, or whatever that is, much more quickly. Um and the, the interesting thing is that for years, there was this debate over stack height. And there still is. I mean, even myself, I, I talk about it, right? Um, but I like those shoes, which are now kind of trying to have your cake and eat it too, right? So not to blow up Hoka too much, but Hoka, with a lot of their shoes, have actually done a really good job. Um, I don't know how, per se, but they're allowing there to be a good amount of material to provide cushion while at the same time still providing good ground feel and stability. And why I wanted to get, kind of illustrate a, a point about cushioning and why I tend to want more ground feel is if, if you guys are listening to this anywhere near a mattress or a couch, 
go try to stand on your mattress on one foot and almost guaranteed you're going to fall over. Right. Same, same time go get on a hardwood floor or just a concrete floor or whatever it is on one foot. And you'll be able to stand just fine because your body gets that feedback and it can regulate your balance that much better. So what I find is that over a longer event, I don't want something where that's so cushy that it's, and I'm going to mix a bunch of words here. So cushy that it's smushy because then what happens is I feel like my foot is sinking down in the material and it almost, it's, it's almost, I mean, it's, it's uncomfortable, right? I want my foot to still be on top of it. Do you know what I'm saying? Am I making sense? Yeah, absolutely. And I, I, I agree wholeheartedly because I, I think to your, your point, um, after a certain amount of time on your feet, you can start to feel your body overcompensating for sure. the lack of ground feel. So yep. if you have a firmer shoe, um, especially when it comes to race day or those longer periods of time, you're not going to spend the extra energy making sure you're balanced. Right. Yeah. I mean, it, it's tricky because you've got so many, we talked about this when we we're talking about nutrition, you've got so many other things going on that just asking your body to give one more thing or to focus on your, your literal balance on an already off camber terrain. That's got rocks and crap and pennies that you're going to run into and, and ding your foot that you're asking your body to do one more thing. You know, it, it's tricky. Um, so yeah, I, I, I find that that cushion aspect, it's, it's almost like fit right. Or size when you step in it and you run in it and a few times you kind of know, you know what I mean? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, yeah. So like, I have Bondi's. I yeah. have um, other max cushion shoes that I'll run in recovery days on the road that I know where yep. flat, straight. I'm not going to, I don't have to worry about kicking a penny or, or slipping on a route. Um, but come race day, it's, you know, it's going to be something a little firmer that's going to give me the cushion to, to last 20, 30 hours, but mm -hmm. also the feel and the confidence of running at mile 90 or hour 27, right. where I can, I'm going to feel comfortable running and not worried about how am I running? Am I going to stay upright? Well, and you know, you, you said something a second ago that made me think of power transfer. So uh, if anybody watching or listening, uh, if you ride a mountain bike <clears throat> and this isn't, I mean, this is not a blanket statement. You can do what you want, but if you've got a full suspension mountain bike, so in other words, there's a shock on the fork, right? The front end, but then the rear also has suspension. When you're going uphill, when you're climbing, you want, if you've got adjustable suspension, like my bike, my daughter's bike, you want to lock out that rear suspension, right? So it's not saggy because what happens is with every pedal stroke you take, if the bike sags back, then you feel like you're just kind of losing that energy. It's wasted energy. And that's why racing flats. That's why, that's why track shoes. I mean, it's just like a super rigid shoe, depending on the taste, of course, but it's super rigid because you don't want that lost energy. You know, now there's the comfortability that comes with some cushion over a hundred miles because a uh, hundred meters and hundred miles, <laughs> a little bit different. Um, but the, the, the loss of power, right. Still remains the same when anytime that energy just kind of escapes to cushion, it's still energy lost. Right. So I think you don't, what I don't want to feel is I don't want my feel, my foot to feel sinking down into something and then having to lift myself out of that thing just to get back to zero. You know what I mean? Yeah, because again, like you, if I run in a, a max cushion shoe yep. that doesn't have a lot of spring, I, if you're going 20 miles, those last five miles, you almost feel clunky, like you're picking yes. up bricks and yep. clogging forward, where you want the shoe to be as responsive as you feel. So you're kind of being thrust forward, not dragging something behind yes. you. Absolutely. Good way to put it that good way to put that. All right, guys. So, Hey, those are the, those are the top five things that we 
are, are looking for when we're selecting that trail shoe. Now, as we kind of get closer, we're going to start talking about what those things are very specifically. Uh, we've talked, Aaron's talked about the speed, Hoka One on a speed, or the Hoka, excuse me, speed goat um, a few times today and been showing that. So that might be the shoe that he goes with. We shall see. Um, it really is going to come down to feel. And I mean, I, I actually feel bad for sometimes uh, just kind of people that, runners that are pros that have to run in a shoe because it's their sponsor shoe. But I have definitely seen, and you guys can see this, there are pictures all over the place where pro runner X who runs, who has a contract with ASICs will, will take a shoe that is by not ASICs and like black it out and then like draw ASICs logos on it just because they want the technology, they want the look and feel, or not the look, but they want the feel and the power or whatever it is. So um, I feel bad that those people can't really choose what they want. Yeah. And it's, it's funny. It's, I mean, this is a good time we're talking about it because we're what? So we got, it's April. So we got May, June, July. August. We got four months, yep. right? So I've got time to probably go into two or three different shoes between yep. now and then. Yep. Um, to figure out what's comfortable for me and not being locked down to a brand makes it that much easier because I have a, yeah. a plethora of choices. So I'll probably try a couple um, and then go with, I'll probably bring three with yeah. me. So. Yeah. Smart. Smart. And when you come out in June, hopefully you can try some. We have yes. no, on the bright side, no pennies on trails, just big giant rocks. I also rattlesnakes. <laughs> both of which i'm cool with. <laughs> all right guys well so listen we would like to hear uh we want to hear what you guys look for like what what is your criteria when looking at a shoe um is it listening to listening to watching reading whatever it is reviews uh is it finding out you know from just kind of putting it on in the shop these days it tends to be that a lot of people order online so you don't get to try it on um do you go into your local run shop you know one of the great run shops um, in Southeastern Virginia, where Aaron is, is running, et cetera. Fantastic shop. They've got a couple locations. Um, and that's kind of Aaron's go-to, right? I mean, and a lot of people in that area is to be able to go somewhere where you trust the people, they begin to know who you are and begin to know what that thing is in particular. In fact, you can check out run running, et cetera. What's their, what's their website? Is it running, running et cetera.com? Cetera. Boom, baby. Running yep. etc. etc. Com. Yep probably don't spell it et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. I but so. yeah, uh, it's a, it's a, a, having a good run shop like that where you can put things on, maybe jump on a treadmill. So how do you choose shoes? I mean, whatever it is, whether it's road, whether it's trail, but trail in particular, since we're talking about these different aspects, um, we'd love to hear that from you guys. So, uh, Aaron, any big plans for training this week? What do you, what do you got coming up? Uh, see this week, uh, run every day, maybe try and plug a 20 miler in at the end of the week. Um, I'm going to Chicago next week, uh, for travel again. So I'll be there Monday to Friday. Okay. Um, so probably again, see if I can't get two double digit, maybe three double digit runs in this week. Nice. Um, and then go into next week with a bunch of city runs in downtown. So there's a great, um, and I, so I don't know Chicago over, I've been a couple times, but not for running very much, uh, but in Milwaukee. So what's that hour up the road? Not quite. Um, there is a great pathway. I forget what it's called, but it's like long. Um, and it's cool. Some of it's along the lake there and some of it just kind of is through forest and stuff like that. It's pretty cool. So strongly recommend. Yeah. If I can get up there, we'll see. Um, if you've got to probably be running around, you know, the, the river there and, or the lake there in Chicago for most of it. But, um, what about you? Where you, what's, what's your plan this weekend? And so I did, uh, eight miles yesterday, eight miles and then two miles walking yesterday. Um, and I feel actually really good today. So I am kind of trying to get back in the rhythm of, it, it was four days a week. Now I'm going to get into a rhythm of five and kind of step that up. And I'm beginning to transition myself mentally, right, away from distance-based running to, to time-based running. Um, because I feel like the distance really isn't going to matter at this point. It just needs to be a time on feet. 
so the trick with me, like I have this trail that's close to my home. I mean, if you guys have seen my Strava, it's on there. Um, you've seen it, Aaron. It's a, it's a great five mile loop. It, it's on kind of a gravel trail, nothing technical about it. Some good ups and downs here and there. Um, the, and that's very close, right? That's less than five minutes away. But the problem is if I want elevation, if I want to push myself, I have to go drive a bit into like, if I'm working all day and then I have to take my daughter to swim practice at night, you know, there's a, there's a path that's a great path to run on kind of near where she swims, but I'm at about that's a, that if I did the whole thing, it's about a 20, I could do 20 miles on it pretty easily. Problem is swim practice is an hour and she, and it's, 10 minutes away from or five or 10 minutes away from the trail. So like, I'm just kind of limited during the week. Uh, so I just have to have to start planning ahead and doing more morning runs. So yeah, that's kind of, basically I need to get my ass out of bed. That's my plan. Get my ass out of bed. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, it's, it gets harder. The older you get and the more responsibility you have, the harder it is to it wake does. up. But David Goggins will tell you you're full of shit and tell you to get up anyway. David Goggins. If you guys haven't listened to him on Rogan, um, he sat there, he would talk, tell the story. I, I can't tell it and we keep it relatively clean. So I won't, but David Goggins said, I get up and I look at my shoes and I stared at my mother effing shoes for like an hour. And I was like, F you shoes. And then he goes, and then I was like, God damn it. And then he put them on anyway and went for a run. And so I've been there, dude. I've gotten up and stared at my shoes and been like, how dare you? Yeah. <laughs> And then, I've gotten up and put them on and gone downstairs and, and started my routine and then sat down and then like, I don't know if I'm getting back up. <laughs> oh yeah. I've fallen asleep in the bed, shoes yeah. and everything on. Yeah. It's not a good situation. So I got to get past that. Uh, I get up at five 30 anyway, but I need to start pushing that back to uh, probably five and, and then progress it back. I, there's a modicum of sleep that I need obviously, but uh, yeah, so that's kind of the plan. So. Anyway, thank you, sir, so much. Thanks to all yos, all yos, all of those of you who are listening. Please like, share, and comment. Follow Aaron on Instagram. Follow me on Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, wherever you guys want to follow us. Um, thanks so much for joining us, you guys. It's been grit number seven. Go find Joy Living. Hashtag FJL. Thanks, guys. We'll see you next time. Dear. See ya.